Another way in which the industry exerts pressure on doctors is by offering us a variety of professional services. In one of these services, widely advertised to GPs, a company representative shows the practice manager how to use a company disk to trawl through the practice database identifying patients with problems which might be treatable with the company's products. When that has been done, a company-sponsored nurse interviews the selected patients and draws up a management plan for the GP which, if approved by the doctor, attracts a Medicare item number. One of these companies proudly announces that over 65,000 patients were assessed in this way in 2005. What, one may ask, is a pharmaceutical company doing assessing patients? It is surprising that no government or professional body has stepped in to prevent this commercially sponsored program. Well, the simple explanation might be that yesterday's sudden drop in share prices pretty much across the board has created what market analysts like to call a buying opportunity. It tends to bring out investors to pick through the ruins, looking for bargains decision by investors that sellers got a little carried away with things so the buyers have lifted all the major indexes today. The Dow, the Nasdaq, the S&P 500 were all up around half a percent in early trading today, and that wasn't a big surprise. The sell-off continued somewhat overseas European markets remain fairly weak, along with many of the Asian markets. But you'll remember that all this started with a big plunge of around 9% on the stock market in Shanghai. Well, Chinese rebounded by around 4%. Is that person really glad to see me? Or are they just being polite? Some people struggle to distinguish a fake grin from a truly happy smile. And computers have found this task even more difficult, that is, until researchers develop a program to detect when a smile is genuine. Visual computing researchers at the University of Bradford in the UK started with software for simulating a changing facial expression. This program can examine a video clip of a human head and identify specific details around the eyes, cheeks and mouth. Then the program tracks the details moving relative to each other as the face smiles. Next, the scientists had their program analyzing two sets of video clips. In one, subjects performed posed smiles. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in a country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there's good news, according to our guests today, and that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology, and they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guest today will help answer that. originates out of a series of debates within criminology about the narrowness of the definition of crime, that essentially, focuses on individual acts of harm, things like interpersonal violence, theft, so on and so forth. 
So the idea of social harm originally was to expand that notion of harm to encompass the harms that organizations and nation states cause. But latterly the idea of social harm really now transcends criminology so there are a group of writers who think that, and I would include myself there, that actually there's something to social harm that could be very useful in terms of trying to understand the harms that occur within society, to produce an objective and well-rounded analyses of harm. Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin, which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books, useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, classic Latin. So what's so new about it? That brings us to the CEO's second duty, building everyone or more accurately, building the senior team. All the executives report to the CEO, so it's the CEO's job to hire, fire and manage the executive team. From coaching CEOs, I actually think this is the most important skill of all. Because when a CEO hires an excellent senior team, that team can keep the company running. When a CEO hire a poor senior team, the CEO is up spending all of their time trying to do with the team and not nearly enough time trying to do with other elements of their job. The senior team can and often does develop the strategy for the company, but ultimately it's always the CEO who has the final go-no-go -no -go decision on strategy. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not, they're, they're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. The Role of Family in Society Families are always related to the economy, the politics, the culture of the society. In herding societies, young people go out when they're 10 or 12 years old, and they hang out with the sheep or the goats, or whatever the herd is. That produces a kind of a loose bond between the pre-adolescents and their parents. In industrial societies, we tend to keep kids in school for longer, and then college is that point when they might break or after college, depending on what they're doing. 
In agrarian societies, families have lots of kids and put them to work. They structure themselves as large families and put them all together in one home. The main point is that families are not separate from the society. Families and the economy and the politics are all wrapped up all together. Now that story has been scotched as a part of a contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? Considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Miri. Something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is there a predicament? Something we have to face up to as a nation? It's been a challenging decade for the music industry, with a significant decrease in sales. For years, little action was taken against illegal downloads, with few effects for downloaders. However, two new approaches are seeing positive results. Firstly, the industry is working with internet service providers to slow an illegal downloader's connection. Secondly, it's working directly with digital music websites. In Sweden. Three out of five illegal file sharers have cut back or stopped, with half of these people moving to legal websites supported by advertisements. The growth of the modern state brought with it the development of mass political parties, and the emergence of professional politicians. A man whose occupation is the struggle for political power may go about it in two ways. First, a person who relies on their political activities to supply their main source of income is said to live off politics, while a person who engages in full-time political activities. But who doesn't receive an income from it is said to live for politics. Now, a political system in which recruitment to positions of power is filled by those who live for politics is necessarily drawn from a property-owning elite, who are not usually entrepreneurs. However, this is not to imply that such politicians will necessarily pursue policies which are wholly biased towards the interests of the class they originate from. The assignment that I'm going to set for the holiday period is one that we've given students for a number of years. It's quite practical, and will allow you to get out and about. It's no good being shut up in your rooms all the time. It does have a written element too. Um, basically, it's our data gathering exercise, and there are two choices with regard to how you collect the data. We'll go through those in a moment. I'm also going to give you a link to an internet site that is, well, it's critical that you review this before you do anything, as it provides a lot of guidance on data presentation, both in terms of how you plot it, its diagrammatic form, and also its description, which has to be clear.
Almost everyone has heard of the London Stock Exchange, but relatively few know anything about the London Metal and Commodity Exchanges. Yet these markets have a greater influence on world economies because they set global prices for some of the essential raw materials for industry and food manufacture. The LME provides three basic services to the world's non-ferrous metal trade. First, it is a market where large or small quantities of metal of a guaranteed minimum standard can be bought and sold on specific trading days. Second, it acts as a barometer of world metal prices. And third, it is a hedging medium. That is, it can help traders get some protection from price fluctuations that occur for economic, political, or financial reasons. Before the beginning of the 1900s, the only way to obtain pearls was by collecting very large numbers of pearl oysters from the ocean floor by hand. The oysters, or sometimes mussels, were brought to the surface, opened and searched. More than a ton of these had to be checked in order to find just three or four quality pearls. Divers often descended to depths of over 100 feet on just one single breath. Now, of course, this exposed them to hostile creatures and dangerous waves, not to mention drowning. In some areas, divers put grease on their bodies to conserve heat, and they held a large object, like a rock, to descend, so they didn't have to exert effort going down. Today, pearl diving has pretty much been supplanted by cultured pearl farms. Particles are implanted in the oyster to encourage the formation of pearls, and this allows for more predictable production. The divers who still work do so mainly for the tourist industry. Abandoned pueblos are scattered throughout the southwestern U.S., and at many, archaeologists have uncovered a curious artifact, the skeletons of scarlet macaws. The bird's bright red feathers are known to have been an important status symbol, a signifier of prestige, for people throughout the American tropics in the southwest, both in the ancient world and today. But macaws are a tropical bird, whose range never extended north of today's U.S.-Mexico border. So how did the Pueblo people obtain the birds? To examine the bird's origin, scientists sequenced mitochondrial DNA found within macaw bones from two sites in New Mexico, Chaco Canyon and the Membres region. Turns out nearly three-quarters of the birds had identical mitochondrial genome sequences, meaning the ancient birds came from the same maternal line. That suggests they were all the products of a breeding operation, perhaps in modern-day northern Mexico, rather than a random collection of wild-caught birds. I think it's really important for young people not to feel restricted in their choices and also to be aware of the choices that are available to them and obviously the media has an incredibly important role to play in that. I think we tend to talk about science as this big kind of monolith but of course actually it's this beautiful multifaceted thing. You know, there's almost something for everybody there. And there are so many different aspects of it. You know, somebody that's going to be attracted to working in biology might be a very different person from somebody who's attracted to engineering. I suppose it's about knowing the breadth of opportunities that are out there and so anything that universities and broadcast media can do to make sure that those opportunities are visible. What is nanotechnology? Well, a report that was put together by a combination of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering that came out last summer, identified two topics, 
Nanoscience is the study of phenomena and the manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular and macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those as a larger scale. Nanotechnologies are wreathy design characterization, production and application of structures, devices and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. So I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what a nanometer is, but loosely speaking people think of nanotechnologies as being a sort of a hundred nanometers or less. Along the way, we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honor. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialize outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. Stephen Lowry RBS Raw was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his city landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits and the unpublished Naranet works, which were only found after his death. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not, they're, they're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. Hi, everybody. This is Joe Biden. I delivered a report to President Obama laying out how far we've come since he put me in charge of the cancer moonshot. That was back in January. And to lay out a real vision for where we need to go in the immediate future, to, to do in five years what otherwise would take 10, to inject a real sense of urgency into the fight against cancer, and to change the culture and reimagine our system in order to be able to win. You know, when President Nixon declared a war on cancer in 1971, he had no army, he had no resources, and no clear strategy. But after 45 years of progress, funding research, training scientists and physicians, and treating millions of patients, we now have an army. And we have tools, powerful tools. And with the moonshot, we now have a clear strategy for the road ahead. 
It matters, folks, because there's a consensus now that we're in an inflection point with science, medicine, technology, all advancing faster than ever and offering real promise. But we can't play by the rules of 1971. We didn't have this working for us. Hi everybody. This weekend we'll dedicate the newest American icon on our National Mall, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a beautiful building, five stories high and some 70 feet below the ground, situated just across the street from the Washington Monument. And this museum tells a story of America that hasn't always taken a front seat in our national narrative. As a people, we've rightfully passed on the tales of the giants who built this country, but too often, willful or not, we've chosen to gloss over or ignore entirely the experience of millions upon millions of others. But this museum chooses to tell a fuller story. It doesn't gauze up some bygone era or avoid uncomfortable truths. Rather, it embraces the patriotic recognition that America is a constant work in progress that each successive generation can look upon our imperfections and decide that it is within our collective power to align this nation with the high ideals of our founding. There are a couple different stories you can tell about our economy. One goes like this. Eight years after the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, our economy has created jobs for 71 straight months. That's a new record. Unemployment has fallen below 5%. Last year, the typical household saw its income grow by about $2,800, the biggest one-year increase ever and the uninsured rate is at an all-time low. All that is true. What's also true is that too much of our wealth is still taken by the top, and that leaves too many families still working paycheck to paycheck without a lot of breathing room. There are two things we can do about this. We can prey on people's worries for political gain, or we can actually do something to help working families feel more secure in today's economy. Count me in the latter camp. And here's one thing that will help right away. Making sure more of our families have access to paid leave. Today, having both parents in the workforce is an economic necessity for many families. But right now, millions of Americans don't have access to even a single day of paid sick leave. When the time comes, its peers should follow suit. Of these, the European Central Bank faces the trickiest challenge, because it has acted as, in effect, the backstop to Eurozone bond markets, a mechanism that otherwise the currency bloc still lacks. But the main safety valve lies elsewhere, with banks and investors. Bitter experience has shown that debt-funded assets can magnify losses, causing financial crises. For this reason, banks must be able to withstand any reversal of today's high asset prices and low defaults. That means raising bank capital in places where it is too low, especially the Eurozone, and not backsliding on strenuous stress tests, as America's Treasury proposes. In the end, however, there may be no escape for investors from the low future returns and even losses that high asset prices imply. They and regulators should take a leaf out of the intelligent investor and make sure that they have a margin of safety.